Hello and welcome to the Sentient Media podcast, where we're going to meet people who are changing the way we think about and interact with our world. It's December 17th, 2020, and today we're going to take a critical look at our food system with Jian Yi, who's in southwestern China. Jian Yi is an award winning independent filmmaker. He's also an artist, a writer. He has a master's degree in international peace studies an MA in international journalism, and he's founder of the Good Food Fund, which is how I first encountered his work. He recently took part in a Financial Times piece about how China is waking up to the need for a greener diet, and Jian Yi ties together the need for policymakers to take a more holistic approach to protecting the environment and look at, the food, uh, look at food sustainability as a whole with a critical analysis of our food system. And just now in November, the Good Food Fund held its annual summit, I believe it was its third annual summit, where 30,000 online attendees could hear lectures on the relationship between food systems and climate change and watch a live stream footage from various organic farms in southwest China. So first of all, I want to say a massive welcome uh, to you, GNU. Welcome to the Sentient Media Podcast. And thank you for taking time out of your busy end of year schedule. Really appreciate having you here. Thank you, Anna. My pleasure to be here. And congratulations on your event. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, were you expecting such a large audience? Did it go how you were planning? Not really. Actually, I, I would like to uh, correct the number. Actually, we had about more than 320,000 people watching it. That's the largest crowd ever Yeah, for our uh, summit and also for the topic. Uh, we had uh, f three editions before that. Uh, they were always uh, on site, offline. So we usually have about 300 people attending uh, on site. But this is the first time because of COVID, we couldn't get a lot of a large cl crowd together at the same place. So we decided to have it uh, online. And surprisingly, uh, it has a very good reception. So. Amazing. And were your attendees all, was it, was it largely a, a Chinese audience or was it global? The speakers are from across the world. Uh, we, do, we did have uh, some listeners from abroad, uh, but the event was live streamed on a Chinese platform, uh, Baidu, which is Chinese Google. Uh, so we think our main, most of our audience are based in China. That's amazing. And was there like any action? Did you kind of feel like you got the message you wanted to get across to this audience? Because they must have been a very you know, a diverse group with so many people, there must have been so many differing opinions. Yeah, right. Um, well, the good thing about live stream is, is that you can reach a, you know, really large number of people. Uh, the, the, the downside of it is that you don't like have a much interaction because uh, it's basically feeding, you know, to them. Uh, so we, we did have, you know, questions. I know this in the chat box. Uh, but we didn't have much of an interaction. And, and that number is actually like added number for the two days. So, so for like a, any given time, we didn't have that many people. Uh, I think at any given time, we had about uh, be somewhere between uh, 20,000 to uh, 90,000. I would say that's time. a lot. <laughs> that's a good yeah, number. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's China. But, but still, still, you know, for a topic like this, you, know, you, don't, you don't usually expect a lot of audience. Do you think that that's got something to do with COVID? Do you think that people are kind of realizing we need to start looking more critically at the food system? Uh, I would say yes, for two reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, definitely uh, people's awareness for health and uh, for our risks uh, has uh, uh, increased significantly since the outbreak of COVID. You know, for myself, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm in my mid 40s and I always lived like for the last, if I, you know, recall my, you know, my uh, uh, formative years, I've always lived, I, I, you know, I lived through these three decades of high uh, speed of uh, economic growth here in China. So you have this uh, either consciously or subconsciously uh, optimism about, you know, about progress. Because, uh, you know, for, you know, Tomorrow you're gonna get richer. Tomorrow there'll be more cars in the street. Tomorrow there'll be some, you know, more things to buy. Uh, so that optimism was there for for quite a while, and and this came. I'm curious about the representation in the media. Um, so obviously, the way that the media 
is represented from different countries. You know, what we see reported in China is different from obviously what you see reported in China, save in the US and the UK. Um, and one thing that I've seen reported from China is the uh, rapid build of multi-story factory farms for pigs. Um, and that was reported as being um, basically like a, an answer to things like COVID and to what's viewed as the unsanitary, uh, you know, wet market setup. Um, is that an accurate portrayal of how it's being presented to the Chinese people? That's partially true because, you know, like any other countries in the world, many, many parts of the world today, uh, there are different uh, forces pushing for different directions in this country. You know, there are people who are uh, much uh, uh, better awareness of what's you know, going on in our world and want to bring change to this world and to our own country. And definitely that, that force is there and, and it's very obvious force. Uh, you can see that in many, among many young people and many, many uh, people like my age or older. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are other forces that are pushing ourselves further into that um, pitfall. And, and this, unfortunately, you know, these forces are um, happening at the same time. And I, I believe that's, the, that's, that's humanity, that's our civilization. You always have, have these contending forces uh, at any given time. You know, there's no perfect uh, ideal world. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's true in that sense. And also, uh, as we always say in Chinese, it takes a long time for a big ship to turn, uh, to make a turn. Uh, than a smaller boat, for example. Uh, so factory farms are not, were not built overnight here. Uh, it was also a very gradual process that people realized, oh, we have to eat a lot of more meat, and, and then, okay, and then what we should we do? Okay, let's build more uh, farms where we can put a lot of more animals, uh, that we can throw this animal there in the smartest possible space, and then, then you know, whatever, they were like machines, they can you know, produce those meat for us. So, so that mentality started to develop, and then, then uh, so over the last few decades, you know, that, that was like the, uh, what happened, and, and that trend is still there. But we are quite optimistic about uh, future changes because, uh, number one, you know, there's no way we can sustain this way. I mean, there's one, you know, there's, there will be going to be time when we feel like we, we're hitting on the wall. And second is that uh, people's awareness, uh, people are saying about health, about environment, and about our own consciousness, you know, as uh, humanity. Yeah, so you're talking about the optimism there. And I know you are, I understand that you're a government-backed organization, right? The Good Food Fund is backed by the government. Yeah, um, we are uh, an organization has, that carries the title China in the name. Uh, so not all organizations can carry that word in their, uh, the name of the organization. We are not like a governmental organization. We are still an NGO, but we, have, uh, we are government uh, accredited uh, national organization. Yeah, and obviously Xi Jinping has decided now to announce the plan to reduce uh, or to create carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, you know, do you, do you like? Do you have any kind of inclination as to why um, he's decided to make that announcement now? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, COVID changed a lot of things, as we said earlier. Uh, one of the things that COVID has changed is that you know China has been so heavily relying on uh, globalization. Right? We are one of the countries that really benefited from globalization in the past few decades, and COVID uh, has brought. Uh, that to uh, a different uh, perspective. Number one is that, you know, COVID itself has stopped a lot of the, uh, you know, the trading and also the businesses. Uh, and that actually was a big blow on our exports and imports. Uh, and secondly, uh, because of this tension between the, the states, uh, because of uh, COVID and or trade tension and t trade disputes and all these things, that made uh, the Chinese government realize that we have to be more self-reliant uh, than before. Uh, so, and, and of course, food is a, a very, very important part of uh, self-reliant uh, for, for a nation. So, so that's why uh, I think the government has, uh, you know, uh, repeatedly talked about self-reliance on, on food. Uh, so we can produce our own food, we, are be able to, we, we should be able to feed ourselves. Uh, not 
relying too heavily on um, imported foods. And what you talk about the the the, the carbon neutral, uh, actually that President Xi Jinping actually surprised all of us. Uh, we knew that, you know, we kind of expected China would take more leadership, especially during this very difficult year, uh, to, to really uh, help further the multilateral, uh, multilateralism in the world, because, the, you know, what the U.S. has been doing and Trump has been doing, so China, we felt that China will do more uh, to strengthen multilateralism. multilateralism. But we didn't expect that kind of level of commitment. So that actually really surprised us, and you know, in a good way, uh, that China uh, President Xi Jinping had made that commitment in a very big uh, occasion. So we tried to uh, connect to that commitment by uh, contributing uh, what we can do in the food space uh, to help China uh, achieve that goal. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because China, as you're saying there about getting independence uh, in terms of control over your own food supplies, like China has really close connections and ownership over a lot of meat plants and production uh, in the USA and Brazil. You know, the demand for pork is obviously driving, you know, a lot of exports. I, I've heard you say food sustainability is a global problem. Um, you know, what do you think, like, how can we globally solve this problem? Like, what do you think we need to do? Well, I think first uh, countries have to take leadership, especially the big, big countries, uh, countries who have a big impact on the rest of the world, like uh, China, US and European countries and other big you know, nations, big producers and consumers. Uh, but that is not enough. Leadership is not enough. Uh, we, we have to build a mechanism for countries to work together. Uh, because it's not enough for one or two countries to take that leadership while the other countries are not doing anything or do, not doing enough. So we have to have a, a global uh, mechanism where uh, all nation states can contribute to uh, what, you know, what, what we usually say like game-changing solutions or uh, uh, big solutions where we can all work together. Uh, so we were happy to see uh, there was, you know, because of the new election in the U.S., uh, we might be able to see, we don't know, you know, but we hope we will be able to see some policy changes in, in, uh, in the U.S., which is, you know, very, very important. Yeah, it is good to see, and I, I am hopeful as well and have some optimism about this, like, global solution, and as actually with COVID, it's an opportunity, um, and everybody's paying mm -hmm. attention, I think, for the first time you know, at least in my life, it seems that the globe is aligning to realize what the real problems are with our food system. Um, but I'm really curious about the history looking at China. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people who follow the whole food plant based diet, like, you know, the China study mm -hmm. by Colin Campbell is obviously, you know, a go to mm -hmm. book, the appreciate, you know, the right. representation of the peasant diet, the appreciation of, you know, rice and tofu, um, and I, you know, you, you kindly sent me your paper, Eating as an Act of Civility. And in there, you were talking about the 1910 approach or the 1910s approach, where you had the elite in China leading a, a vegan vegetarian movement uh, compared to uh, the 2010 approach, where you have more of uh, like the people themselves leading this movement. I was wondering, like, if you could shed some more light on the history of veganism and what role it plays in Chinese society. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you uh, you were able to read that uh, paper that I wrote because it's long. Uh, uh, but I think I, I think I made some uh, important points there. Uh, that's like the first paper ever to write about the 2010 uh, movement here in China, uh, which I call the Ch the new Chinese vegetarian or vegan movement. Because in Chinese we have the same. We don't have a word distinguishing uh, vegetarian or, or vegan. So I I I, I might be use these two words interchangeably. Uh, so I, I, I call it the second wave um, in modern Chinese history because uh, uh, the first one happened in 1910s led by the revolutionaries, like the founding father of the Chinese Republic, uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And as a part of their efforts to build a, uh, a Chinese nation state, because China was just got, just got out of the, uh, the dynasties and trying to build a republic and so they think uh, vegetarianism can strengthen Chinese nation uh, because it's 
pure, is healthy. You know, it's it's, it's amazing. You know, to read to read all this uh, by uh, that their their understanding of vegetarianism more than hundred years ago now. Um, and on the other hand, because simply because they believe that uh, vegetarianism would build a stronger Chinese nation, then China would be able to uh, win the what what was then uh, zero sum game uh, international co uh, contests right because back then it was all this imperialism all these world wars later on uh, it was a harsh time you know in in in, in terms of international uh, environment for 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 like uh, new nation states like China uh, so they they believe that was a good way for us to win that competition but a hundred years later we face a very different uh, international kind of a challenge uh, the challenge came less from like imperialism or invasion from other nation states, but more from uh, a, a problems that actually uh, we all have to confront as nation states, like climate change, right? Like uh, biodiversity loss, like public health and all these issues, they're all global. Uh, so we had to work together. It's not a zero sum game anymore. Uh, this is something that we had to, all of us have to be part of it, part of the solution. So both, both movements actually had their inspirations from overseas. Uh, the first one also came from like evidence-based science uh, from overseas back then in 1910s. And the second one, as I analyzed in my paper, also was inspired by uh, environmental uh, vegetarianism and also uh, books like, uh, like the China study, as you mentioned, and also uh, uh, Earthlings that both came out actually uh, in the uh, 2000s. So, so that was like the right time for China to, to, uh, to, to, you know, for many Chinese people to waken up to that issue. And secondly, because I have to, because uh, China's uh, economic de uh, development came after uh, 1992. So, so in the 2000s, we have more than uh, 15 years of uh, really high speed economic growth. And uh, the good side of it is that it really elevated a lot of people out of poverty. But on the, the, the downside is that uh, we have seen really, really grave uh, environmental degradation and also uh, uh, a degradation of our health. Uh, so, so the many, many issues that actually came out only after we uh, have benefited from this high speed of economic, economic growth. So that actually made us rethink, you know, what went wrong? And, and, and so, uh, as I see it, you know, vegetarianism in the 2010s was actually one of our uh, responses to that question, what went wrong? And, 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 and improve that actually by simply by um, changing the way we relate to food, uh, we can change a lot and we can actually find answers to that question, what went wrong? Uh, so, uh, so that's interesting. And the second thing I would like to say, you know, you mentioned about traditions and, and, and then the legacy of the Chinese uh, culture from the past. Actually, uh, in, in Chinese history, uh, as I, you know, read through different papers about uh, vegetarianism in Chinese history, uh, the laymen, uh, so we had a very strong influence uh, by the Chinese Buddhism which actually draw a very clear line between uh, meat-based food and uh, veg, you know, uh, plant-based food. Uh, but among, for, for, for centuries, among people who are outside that circle, uh, people, for people who are not uh, Buddhist monks or nuns, uh, they didn't actually draw a very uh, clear distinction between the two. Uh, so for us, uh, we call it su, which is the, is the word that we use now for vegetarian or, or vegan. Back then, actually, for lay people, it only meant food that can make your body lighter. Uh, so, but, you know, that's healthy and light. Uh, but then, but did not necessarily mean uh, they were 100% uh, plant-based. It's only uh, in the 1910s, during the first movement, and in the 2010s, the second movement, the, the people who are outside the religious circle started to draw that distinction. So that's a very interesting thing that have been overlooked by uh, many people who, uh, who, who studied Chinese uh, traditions and cultures about vegetarianism. So I think that's a significant, uh, a significant 
thing about the both movements a uh, hundred years apart. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thanks for shedding some more light on that. Um, I, I'm curious, like how this brings two things to mind. One is um, that obviously the consumption of meat in China accounts for a third or nearly a third of the whole global consumption of meat, right? Like, how did we get to that point where you know whether it's religion or health or, or all of these other aspects that we're encouraging uh, Chinese people to eat more plant-based and even you know my experience in China is that there is always there's always plants there's always rice there's always tofu on the table you know mm -hmm. and meat mm -hmm. often forms like you know an additional little extra portion at least in in my experience like how did we get to this point where we are now do you think that's absolutely true. Uh, meat was like a decoration on the plate. You know, plants were at the center of our plate for centuries. Although, you know, in festivals, uh, you would have, you tended to have more meat and more animal-based food as a celebration, you know, because these, are, these were not food that you normally would have. And also, I would argue that, you know, the reason that we have been a predominantly uh, plant-centric, uh, we follow a predominantly a plant centric centric diet is that we have been an agriculture nation for centuries. We were not we were not nomads like the Mongolians. Uh, so, as a nation, you know the the Han Chinese, which is the the dominant uh, ethnic ethnicity in China, which accounts for I would say probably ninety eight percent of the population. We have been always been an agriculture nation for 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 centuries, and as an agriculture nation, we were actually bound to our land. And we knew that resources are finite. So that you know, very idea of finite resources actually was very precious that we should have carried today. Uh, but back then, you know, we knew that resources were finite, we were bound to our land. Uh, our sons, our children and grandchildren will be using the same land. We we'll have to rely on the same land if there were no wars or other things that, that you know, we had to leave that land. Otherwise, we would you know, rely on the land for, for, for generations. So we, that mentality of stewardship uh, actually was in the center of why, how we formed our diet. Because we knew that the most efficient way to feed ourselves is to feed, feed ourselves directly instead of feeding animals and then have animals feed us. You know, that's a very stupid way of, you know, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you already know that uh, you have finite resources. So... Uh, um, of course, there are other limitations that you know made us this way, but I think that you know that that thing you know, is in 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 the center of our culture that stewardship of of land. Uh, unfortunately, we we lost that. You know, so so I think that's the one reason that we've been eating so much because we lost our, our connection with land, with 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 our food, and then if you can't see your land, if you can't see your food, you don't know where food comes from. You don't have that bound, you know, that boundary with your 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 land, and you don't form that uh, stewardship uh, with the resources and the the precious uh, land that that uh, that have been feeding us. And the second reason is that uh, I think it's you know when we started to eat more meat, as our uh, economy start, economy started to take off uh, in the nineteen nineties. I don't think anyone, you know, I would say, I would argue that hardly anyone uh, started with an evil mind saying, oh, I had to ruin the environment, or I have to ruin my own health, or I have to kill, you know, all these millions of animals. I don't think so, you know, because back then, people, what they had in mind is that we want a good life. And then what is a good life? All right. Okay. Prosperity. What is prosperity? Dinner table. What would you have in a dinner table? Well, you know, what we want to eat like festivals every day. And, well, it was not possible. Now it's possible because they are, you know, there. Uh, so factory farms came and they, they produce this cheap meat and they produce this, you know, uh, stuff that are harmful for our body, but they're cheap. They are variable. Uh, so, and we didn't realize they were bad for us. Then we didn't realize they were bad for the environment and we didn't see them. Uh, that they were bad for the animals uh, because they were hiding somewhere and we never really see them. And so, yeah. So I, didn't, I don't, don't think that anyone really started with a bad intention. You know, I, you can't blame anyone who wants to just have a good life and have prosperity. 
But then how we understand a good life, how do we define what is good life and how we and, and who to define a good life. I think that's very important. We can't, you know, let people who, we can't just let corporations who want to seek profits to define what is good life, what is prosperity. We have to take back that ownership of definition what good life is and what prosperity is. And I think that's why I think, you know, people are changing now because we want to define our own lives. And we want to define what good life we should pursue. Very well said. I mean, you've thrown up so many points there. Um, you know, the idea of vulnerability, like we we're talking about in the beginning, people realizing that our reliance on a global food system that we have no insight into, there's no transparency about where we get our food from, the point there's no, you know, there's no stewardship or relationship to the land. I think that's, I mean, I think it's coming to the forefront of everybody's mind now, which is great for people like in our field of work where we want to create transparency and create a better relationship uh, to our food systems and to what's on our plates um, and I also it, it reminds me of some of the work in the USA about um, transformations with farms so there's a lot of groups that are working with ranchers to help them transition from animal agriculture to say mushroom or hemp growing um, is there anything like that in China in the sense of helping people who are currently involved in large-scale factory farm production and helping them transition back to perhaps what they would have been doing in the 1910s, like creating, you know, the, the rice and the, and the vegetables? I would say that that kind of changes you see more often in smaller farms. Uh, I, I recall probably since like 10 years ago, there has been a, a new trend among young people uh, living in big cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, they were fed up. They were fed up with the food they, they, were, they could get in the cities. And they were fed up the fact, with the fact that they couldn't find healthy food for their young children. Uh, they were like in their uh, late 20s or early 30s, they, so they have young children to feed. And they're really fed up about that. And they decided to go back to where they came from uh, because they, you know, they came from probably from a smaller city or rural areas and they came to uh, the bigger cities for education and they stayed. Uh, and they started uh, um, ecological farming uh, back in their home, hometown or home village. And, and that, was a, that, that, that is actually a trend that's been going on for uh, a decade now. And and this, you know, these people make you feel very hopeful for, uh, for our agricultural system because they prove that, you know, one, uh, agriculture doesn't have to be uh, the way that, you know, we, we had in the last uh, three decades. Uh, it can be, uh, a, 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 you know, a good way to show our stewardship to our land. You know, they prove that we can produce uh, healthy food and sustainable food for people, still in a, in a, you know in 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 a way that is uh, that can sustain. You know, it's not like uh, you 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 it's, it's not like as people say that is very inefficient. You can they can produce in an efficient way as well, and that's one thing. And second thing is that they prove that you know uh, it, you know good agriculture and good uh, production of food can be a lifestyle. You know, you can actually. Uh, it can, it can actually lead a life that is kind uh, to yourself, to other people, and to the earth, and, and to other, to, to other uh, earthlings. So I think that's important to, to prove that. You know, you, you, people probably can, you can argue that, but it's another thing. It's one thing that you argue that, and it's another thing that you prove that. Uh, so I think that's very important. Um, for, uh, as far as the factory farm, tr transformation of factory farms are concerned, Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that uh, for many different reasons. Uh, number one is that people's awareness of factory farming uh, is still not very high uh, in the general public for a reason I will, I will talk about later. And second is that government, you know, is so, uh, government policy is still uh, quite problematic in that sense because the you know, uh, government part government policy still prioritize efficiency and productivity rather than uh, health and sustain sustainability. So more short term rather than long term. Uh, so the bigger your farm is, uh, your factory farm is for animals, 
uh, the most subsidies you can get from the government. So, so that is like um, a way. So that's why you know, I sometimes say that you know, there's in in that sense, there's no uh, there's no vegan in China because you know, as vegans, we actually pay tax, and some of the tax is going to support this factory farms. Unfortunately, the bigger they are, the the more support they get from the government. So that policy has to change, and government, I believe, government will see that um, sooner or later. Uh, that is actually uh, against our interest, uh, uh, you know, as a uh, as a nation, uh, and and for our future generations. The, fir the the first reason that I said I would explain later is that um, after several years of. Uh, advocacy, we realize that we have to find uh, a middle path where we can meet the majority of people. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, in traditional Chinese culture, there was not such a big distinction between uh, people who are 100% uh, plant-based and people who are, you know, who are not 100% uh, plant-based. But for the for the uh, during the 2010s movement, uh, we that distinction has become much much more uh, clear, and that's that's a good thing in on one hand because then you know it develops an identity that you know people get proud of. That for example, I'm vegan myself, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm proud of that fact that I'm not hurting other animals. But on the other hand, you know, and that's good. At the, at the, on, I think that's good at, still at the personal level, but at the level of a public uh, advocacy, I would argue that you know that will actually counteract counteract a lot of the efforts that we are making, because then it becomes very black and white. You know, it becomes binary. Uh, it's either us or them, the rest of the world. Uh, and that actually creates tension, creates grief, creates. Um, Distrust, and um, so the more you talk about these issues, the more people don't trust you because they think you're you're too radical. Yeah, yeah, you know. So for the last three years, I, we've been advocating for ripping off that label, uh, that label of uh, veganism. Uh, it's it's like you know ripping off the that label of uh, uh, what's the word? Sorry, it's my English. Uh, feminism. So it's like ripping off that uh, label of feminism because gender equality concerns all of us. But when you apply that label of feminism, it seems like it's only the, a problem of the women. You know, it has nothing to do with men. And then the men can can get away from doing anything. Uh, same thing with veganism. You know, when people don't want to talk, you know, think about this issue, they, they just simply apply that the label, say, oh, this vegan. Uh, propaganda. This is veganism. You know, I don't want to be part of it. So they just get away from not really uh, doing anything. Um, so we have been trying to rip off that label uh, and say this is not a problem of the vegans. This is a problem for all of us. You know, look at what risks we are taking for public health, for the environment, for you know, for our own very ethics as humanity. So. So yeah, I think uh, the reason that you know factory farming issues are not is not very uh, much promoted among the general public, among the mainstream, is that that it's been too much on the side of uh, has a too strong uh, association with veganism, uh, which unfortunately uh, backfires. Yeah, I think it's a really great point. Well, you touched on so many awesome things there, but I I wanted to ask you. Um, I obviously I could hear your your child in the background and I think I heard you say in one event that you don't take your child to the supermarket. Yeah, he was born vegan. And and my wife was also uh she's largely vegan. Um we don't for example, it's not just vegan vegan is not just about food, right? We don't buy any animal products, any you know, not just food but also uh uh footwear and other things. Um he actually, you know, we think he's a, he's a Buddha. <laughs> uh, you know, any, any child is a Buddha. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's an angel, as you say, probably in the, in the West. 
Uh, well, I became vegan because of him. Um, so three months down into her uh, pregnancy, my wife was diagnosed with, uh, you know, we were in a, the best private hospital in Beijing. And, and we also went to the best public hospital in Beijing for that uh, examination. And we were told by our uh, doctor that uh, our kid uh, would be, had a very high probability to be a kid with Down syndrome. And that was like the end of the world for me because this is our first child. I, I, I couldn't remember how, how I walked out of the hospital that day. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I started to practice uh, Buddhism uh, three years after I became vegetarian. And I thought I was a good Buddhist. Uh, you know, I'm Zen, you know, I'm all this. But when something like this happened, you realize you were not Zen enough. <laughs> because you, you feel like you were actually left to confront this reality that life offers you, that nobody else can share it with you. This is a reality that you have to face. You have to confront. You have to shoulder it probably for the rest of your life, if there's a kid with Down syndrome. And I never had a kid before. I didn't know how, what that meant, but I knew it was a serious stuff. So I, so I went online and looked for information. I couldn't find anything helpful in the Chinese language website. So I started to look at the English language website. And I found these forums there that, you know, parents, mothers who had the same problems, they were sharing their experiences. Some of them are Christians. Some of them, are, they don't have any religions. But they really moved me, you know. They were, they were saying things that really, like, really touched your heart. That they had the same problem, you know, and they shared their journey, how they, how they deal with it, and how they... I think that's, that's like more than I have learned, you know, in the three years of practicing Buddhism. And that very... Um, uh, mind, you know, that very mindfulness that you you started to carry uh, with you every day, whatever life gives to you, because you can't choose, right? You can't choose what life gives you. There's always something f for you in the next minute that you you would never anticipate, probably. And that very uh, mindfulness is the most important gift we have as, hum as, as human beings. And, and I forgot that, you know. So, so that really helped me uh, have that mindfulness. So I, you know, I made a few resolutions after that. Number one is that, you know, whatever my, my, my child, I didn't know whether he was a boy or a girl, whatever my child turned out to be, whether he's a kid with Down syndrome or Down syndrome, doesn't matter, you know. That's the life I will have. And that's one thing. And second thing is that I will be a better practi practitioner of Zen. <laughs> I will practice my mindfulness. And number three, I will, you know, I have this connection with children with Down syndrome, right? Whatever my child will turn out to be. So for the rest of my life, I will, you know, help children with Down syndrome. And number four is that I will be a vegan. Because, you know, I was a vegetarian for, before that I was a vegetarian for how many years? For five years. I read about cows, but didn't really register with me. Uh, you know, we didn't kill them, right? Of course, oh, they're miserable. They have a miserable life, but still they have a life. And they live to their end. Uh, yeah, they didn't register. But once you went through that, you know, you see, first you saw how many risks it was for female to be pregnant with, with, you know, with the young. And how much it had changed your, your women, you know, both physically and, and, and mentally. And second is that, you know, you, you know, you see life, you know, you see the birth of life. You see, you know, how much it takes for life. To, to form. Taking the blinkers off and accepting and acknowledging life 
um, whether it's human or non-human, um, I think it's really beautiful. I think that's a wonderful story you've just shared, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, so that, that's the last resolution I made. I will become vegan. I will be vegan. So I don't think everybody has, you know, will have that experience in their lifetime. So I understand if somebody's not, and I, I, I fully respect, you know, people who are honest about their choice. Uh, but I think for myself, you know, that's some, uh, a life-changing moment. You've shared some fantastic stories with us and I just wanted to like round this off. Um, you know, I would love to be able to give an action for the people who are listening. Like, you know, what do you think? It, okay, so let me rephrase this. We, we need industry, we need policymakers and we need individuals to come together and we need these things to align um, in order for change to be made, right? Um, mm -hmm. But for the people who are listening as individuals, like, what do you think, you know, what could be like the single biggest thing that they could do today to help create a better food system? I think the most important thing uh, any individual can do if they want to bring change to the food space or any space they want to bring is connect, to form connections. Connect with policymakers, connect with people who produce meat, uh, connect with people who, you know, who want to eat, dine with you, um, connect with young people. That's very important because you can't, you can't change anything if you push people off. You know, you have to pull them. You have to show them that you are doing this for, for good reasons, for reasons that are not just good for yourself, but it's good for everybody. And yeah, we just need to know that, you know, we are not living in a, in a vacuum. You know, we're not in living in a bubble. We are living with other people. And that's the beauty of food. Food connects all of us. And if you choose good food and you stop, connect, stop connecting with other people, then what's the point of choosing good food? Yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's yeah, been very yeah. eye-opening for me and emotional and um, I really appreciate you being so open. And no, this is a topic that I feel very, you know, just like deep in my heart. I feel so personal and so, um, so important, so, so transform transformative.